Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Championship Leadership Podcast, and, and uh, I'm really, really excited for today's guest that we have with us today. Um, he spent over 20 years inside of Special Forces with the Delta Force Unit. Um, he's a retired Command Sergeant Major. Um, he, uh, you may have heard of the movie Black Hawk Down. That was uh, Tom Satterley. Our guest today was was uh, part of that um, that mission. Yeah, that was his first combat experience. Was was uh, a part of the Black Hawk movie that many of us are familiar with. Uh, he also has a foundation, All Secured Foundation, which is there to help out uh, Special Forces combat veterans in their life afterwards, after the military. Um, his wife's got a foundation called the Var uh, Virago Foundation uh, for women. His wife, Jen, she's also writing a book called Virago that should be coming out hopefully within the next six months or so. Uh, Tom also has a book, All Secure, A Special Operations Soldiers Fight to Survive on the Battlefield and the Home Front. And I've really been enjoying and loving this book and excited to maybe get into that a little bit. You can follow Tom and, and find out more information on the foundation on his book at TomSatterly.com. Um, you can you can follow him on Instagram at Tom Satterley. Also find out more information uh, about the All Secure Foundation at All Secure Foundation on Facebook and Instagram. So with that, I'm just really honored and, and thankful to have you here to spend some time with us today, Tom. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate being here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I always like to kick off the conversation with this question. The name of the podcast is, is Championship Leadership. And just curious, like, what comes to mind for you? What, is, what does that mean to you when you hear championship leadership? Uh, to me, that would mean somebody that's in tune with themselves and has a deep understanding of who works for them instead of just um, on the surface, but gets to know the people. Because once you, once you truly invest in being a leader and you get to know the individuals personally, then you know what's bothering them versus they just show up at work and they're in a bad mood or doing horrible work that day. And if you knew that they had a child in the hospital or was sick or something, then you could be in tune to what's going on with them. So leaders need to be in tune with who, who, who works under them to be a championship leader. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, going back to your experiences, I, I would imagine in the military and in the operations and missions that you, you guys were constantly on that, um, that was, uh, you know, probably amplified to really, to know what's going on uh, for your soldiers that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis, side by side. Yes. It was amplified, but I'd say my job was one of the easiest in the world when you're an E9 in charge of, you know, other E9s and E8s and E7s. Yeah. And, oh, and if you have E6s and E5s, it's because they wanted to be there and they're the best at what they do anyway. So you're kind of less of a leader and more of a, a guider, you know, like I used to, uh, you know, I used to be in charge of people that were like mules that never stopped, but you had to whip them to get them going. And then when I, when I got around with these group of stallions and I was in charge of them, I was like, I, I came to know that I'd rather have a pack of stallions that you got to pull back on than, yeah. than a group of mules you got to beat to get them going. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Then that, uh, that uh, definitely makes complete sense. Um, maybe you could give us, uh, a little insight on just like your path. And I don't know if you mess, you know, I guess I'll, I'll allow you to go wherever you go with it, but, but the path to maybe really, you know, I'm interested in all secure foundation. Um, you know, maybe some of the struggles that you obviously went through that, that created the book that have helped you through this process that now you're that leader that's going out to be like, man, these are the struggles I went to. I didn't, maybe you didn't have those resources of help. And so now you've created this all secure foundation, but yeah, just give us a little, insight into you and how you've gotten to where you are today with the book and the foundation. Yeah, that would, that would take you back to 86, <laughs> 85, yeah. 85, really. When I graduated um, high school, I was just going to go to college and I'd started courses and my parents were paying for it and I was blowing all their money. So a friend <laughs> of mine, a friend of mine had joined the military. He had just gotten back from basic training and uh, we were going to a John Cougar concert that night and he's telling me all about basic training and AIT and it's great. He's going to Germany for two years. His hair was really short. He goes, this is because we grew up in a band, you know, we played in a band, we've odd long hair and his was all gone. And so it was a shock to me, but he was used to it. And he's like, the haircut's not even that bad. You should try it. And by the time we got to <laughs> Indianapolis, um, I had decided to join the army and uh, my brother had joined the army when he was in, a junior in high school and went to basic training in between that summer. And I used to make fun of him. It was, it was, <laughs> I was, I was relentless at making fun of his haircut at school. You know, he was a senior. I'm a, I'm a freshman. And 
making fun of him and his haircut and the army thing. And then I ended up being in the army for 25 years, but yeah, it, uh, that path took me to Germany in 86. And for three years, I was stationed in Germany. And for two of those years, my platoon started taking us to French commando school, German ranger school. I got to go to, we went to platoon confidence training and bad told Germany where I got to see the SF guys throw you over a rappel tower. And, um, I was kind of introduced to a bunch of more exciting things and mm -hmm. um, a higher level of training instead of sitting in the motor pool every Monday and changing oil in my APC. So yeah. I kind of shifted gears and decided to reenlist to get to uh, jump school so I could get to Fort Bragg. And that's put me on the track to go to the Green Beret recruiters and go through the Q course. Six months after that, you know, about a year later, actually, I, I through SFAS, I'm through the Q course and I'm in language school and I was approached to go try out for the unit. And I was like, okay, what's that? You know, and they kind of described it to me as much as they would. And it sounded even better. So I just kept climbing and climbing with no plan. I mean, I was lucky because I never had a plan of what I was going to do other than I'm going to go this direction now. And I don't know what's after that. And so made the unit in 91, spring of 91 and finished up at the end of 91. And so now I got another about a year and a half before Somalia is going to kick off. And we're doing missions around the world and things like that are cool. But first combat mission was um, in Somalia 93 for Black Hawk Down. And that was that, you know, the 18 hour firefight that, that shaped and changed the course of my life um, mm -hmm. for good and for bad. And, uh, you know, after that, I thought life would be easy. Everything compared to Somalia, that 18 hours stuck out in the city that night would be, would be a breeze. But as you're moving up that ladder and you become in charge of people, you start to, I start to discover a new kind of fear. Now we're in Iraq. We're going after, uh, you know, the regime leaders, which was, was okay. I mean, it was okay. Wasn't as violent. And then the foreign fighters start coming in and I'm in charge of these, these, uh, these stallions that want to go get at it. Yeah. And, uh, and that takes a deeper toll on you to be a leader of people, to be in charge of all those souls and to have any one of those injuries or loss of life come back on my soul was, was a, uh, a heavier weight than running around and breaking things and shooting people. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, incrementally you're in charge of 30, 50, you know, at one point I was the CSM at the 10,000 person task force and no, you're not responsible for all those people, but you know about everything that happens along the way. And it's, uh, takes its toll. Yeah. And so that lead, led me all the way up to retirement when I'm hiding things. I'm, uh, I'm burnt out. I'm at 25 years now. I'm really burnt out and I'm trying to, push on but you know i i just really didn't care much about myself anymore um i love the job but i was struggling at, at doing how good you needed to do to be there and so finally retired and i just uh i took a job in jordan for two years training uh their military to be special forces qualified and that kind of carried me over as a transition for a little while Right. I'm, I feel like I'm in the army, but I'm getting paid more money. Yeah. You know, my off time's my own and no worries. And then um, that job dried up and I sat at home in bed for months watching TV all day or all night sleeping in the day. I had no purpose, no task. And I got to the point where I, I was going to kill myself one day. So that takes me to the foundation. Right. My, I, mm -hmm. I met the woman that saved me. And uh, fell in love and, and she fought for me. I tried to ruin it the entire time. I tried yeah. to push her away. I tried to make her not like me, you know, yeah. literally did everything I could, not on purpose, but just that's, that's kind of what you do. You struggle through like Homer Simpson. You're like, don't say this, don't say this, don't say this. And then you say it out loud. And you're like, ah, oh, why can't I stop <laughs> yeah. myself? You know, you feel like, oh, no, you know, and it's, yeah, <laughs> that she's stuck with it. That one. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you're doing it. And yeah. you, you're telling yourself not to do it, but you just got to do it. And uh, that's when I learned that it was muscle memory and the PTS that I was addressing everything in my life with, you know, whether it was dirty dishes or whether it was the, the house or somebody who's not on time, I would get very aggressive and very angry about it and try to take over and fix it, you know, be in charge and, mm -hmm. and save lives when no life was on the line. And so that's when uh, Jen hits me with a frying pan and says, listen, you were a leader in, you might as well be a leader out right now. You're just kind of like a loser. You're just, mm. you're just wallowing around in your own misery. What good is that? People are going to follow you and uh, push me to do the book, which I would never have done. Right. Yeah. I would have never have done a book. Um, 
catching flack about it the whole way. I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah. People don't even know what the book's about and I'm catching flack. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, when they figure out what the book's about and they're reading it, they're like, Oh wow. Great book. Thank you. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's such a help, the self-help book. Yeah. Um, but I got out there and she's like, let's be the leaders. Let's be the first on the dance floor and let's get out there and show people what's wrong with us, how we fixed it. And what, what by we, she meant me. <laughs> so, you know, writing the book and throwing everything out there that was horrible, um, that I'd done in my life. Uh, the things I was embarrassed of, regretted, the way I treated people, and then tying it all to PTS and, and taking responsibility for all of it was very cathartic for me to, to be throwing that out there and to be doing it in a way to help other people. And my wife's been there the entire time. I mean, if you read the book, she's the hero in the book. She's literally the hero in the book and she continues to be the hero today, helping other people. So. The feedback from the book has been so amazing. Uh, people calling, texting, every platform reaching out to me every day, day and night about, you saved me, you helped me, I'm gonna go get help. It made me realize this or that. So the book is doing exactly what we wanted it to do. We wanted it to reach people, to go down deep and be honest and have people say, oh, it's okay. It's okay for me to admit and talk about this. And if I do that, I'll start getting better versus waiting and waiting until I'm 75 and 80 years old. And now I'm going to get help because I'm, yeah. you know, I'm tired of feeling miserable. So we tell everybody that I've, I've done a lot of speak engagements and Vietnam vets, new recruits, uh, a, a person from the battle of the bulge was there. He's in his 90 something, obviously. And yeah, wow. we sat there after I did a speak engagement and we were just crying together. He's like, I wish I would have gotten help that many years ago but I'm going to go, even though I'm this old, I'm going to go get help. And the same thing from Vietnam vets. And it, and it kind of led me to believe, well, it kind of underscores the fact that help is out there and you can get it as soon as you start trying, right? As soon as you start putting in the work, you'll start feeling better. And I, I can tell you, there's not a story I haven't heard or done um, embarrassing or funny either way. Uh, and we have no judgment. We don't, we don't, you know, pass judgment on anybody. Yeah. We don't really care about the stories because those stories are how you got there. We talk about how you feel now because uh, whether you're a general or a private or a CEO of a corporation or you work in the mill room, when you go home, you're somebody's spouse and all they want you to do is be there for them and love on the children and take care of the family. So that's yeah. what we're trying to work on right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. And kind of giving us an idea of, you know, the path that you've been on and what's t uh, taking you to where you're at today. You know, I think I was in, I was in a uh, officer basic course in, in uh, Aberdeen proving grounds as a ordinance officer. And we had uh, one, one of our, my classmates, uh, he had a ranger tab, he had a special forces tab and uh, us, the instructors are like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, and I got to know him uh, very well, but it was very quickly, you know, what, what he had described to me, like, you know, uh, as, you know, some black ops the past few years and just some of the stuff that you could just, you know, we didn't talk a lot about what he did or, but just, there was some, there was some, all of the stuff that you are talking about, like he was going through and it was, it was a rough three months for him and you could see what he was going through. And so that just brings me to a question of like, you know, as a leader, because as a special operator, especially, um, I can imagine th there's a certain mentality that you have to have that isn't necessarily conducive with being a great husband and a great father, um, because it, those worlds kind of have to be separated. And, and then, you know, figuring out how to mix that, figuring out how to deal with, with the things that you experience. Is there something that is being done or that can be done uh, while they're actually in service? Uh, versus, you know, a lot like your foundation, it sounds like you deal more with the folks that obviously are out, right? We we're actually started um, late last year. We spoke to about 300 new um, Green Bray students. Okay. Yeah. And so it, it went so well. They've invited us back four times this year to speak to the different classes going through. Um, we're taking that whole element, the, the 12 person, a 12 couple element on a retreat as well. Yeah. Um, we're starting to tap into the active duty and, yeah. and we're hitting the air force pararescue guys as well, because give you the tools. Now, when mm -hmm. you see it come up, you'll know what it is. You'll know to expect it. You're still going to do your job, Yeah. but it's yeah. another tool in your tool bag 
to kind of deal with what's going on. And we're, we're, we're coding it as keeping the war fighters, you know, tip the spear sharp. And that way, if you're mentally healthy, it, tie it with physical health and the training that you've gone through, you're a better soldier than if you're struggling and hiding it and drinking. And oh, by the way, you're still a good soldier, physically fit, and you have all your training. However, you're suffering silently because you don't want to talk about it. So we're offering up to uh, First Special Forces Command Group their own, their own retreat as well. So they can learn everything that we're teaching so they can impose that upon their leaders and pass it on down, kind of a train the trainer. But yeah, we're definitely getting into that as well as this year, we're moving into online content, um, hopefully out in the next three or four months at the most to be people to be able to go online to our website, log in, get the program and start anywhere in the world, whether you're in Montana or Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere, you can pull it down and you can start doing some of these tools that we do on these four day retreats with these couples. It's not just for, you know, single or, or married people. It's, it's for everybody as human beings. It's kind of a, a human being training program. We don't, we don't like to call it therapy. We don't do that. We retrain people because that's what they understand. You've got years of muscle memory of violence and aggression and those tools do well in combat and we bring them home due to muscle memory. So that yeah. thing happens and I pop up, you know, it's kind of like drawing your pistol. Years went to my hip, yeah. my hip, my hip. Stress situation go to my hip. I moved it to my chest one time. Practice for a couple of days. I got this down right. Real world situation. Guy pops up. My weapon jams. I go for my pistol on my hip. Oh. What am I grabbing? My hip. You know. Yeah. And it kind of hit me. Well, that's the deal. Yeah. It's muscle memory. Yeah. And you have to train yourself to be happy to handle situations differently, and um, and it'll take time. Sooner or later, you know, you're more happy than you are aggressive and then you're more and more and more happy and less and less you get that aggressive attitude and behavior popping into your head. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that you guys did the couples retreats as I was looking at your website before this. And, uh, you know, just, you know, I don't have any combat experience, but, uh, but it's, it is so important. I know this now looking back, I come from back from deployment. My wife wanted to go to a couples retreat and I said, no way. Like right? that's for people that have that, that, like that have issues and I just so regret it now I, because it, it was like a, a six or seven, eight year dummy tax that I paid with struggles in my marriage because I didn't take that time. I didn't realize the importance of reconnecting, coming back. And just now knowing like, God, I'm so glad that you guys are doing that. And, but just, is it, is it, cause I know me when I was in the military and as a young man, like, you don't think you need any of that. You didn't, you almost don't even want to hear it. How hard is that as a leader to, to communicate that, to, to get through them to them so that they can listen and hear it. It is very difficult. When we were talking to those Greenberg candidates and they were young and they were looking yeah. up at me and I, I've been in that seat. I know. Yeah. And I tell them yeah. straightforward. I said, I know you're sitting in that seat thinking this old guy didn't know what the hell he's talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. When am I out of here? So I can go shoot somebody in the face. I said, listen, yeah. Those people shoot back mm -hmm. and they'll hit you or your friends and it's going to suck. If it doesn't suck, there's something wrong with you, you know, it, and it will yeah. affect you. So I'm giving you tools now to understand what's happening while it's happening. So you'll be a stronger soldier, but it will happen to you. Don't sit there and say it won't happen to me. I go, how many people, you know, you know, raise in 300 people. How many of them have been in combat? Of course, all the instructors raise their hands about six or seven of the instructors. Okay. How many of you know somebody who committed suicide? Half the class. How many of you know somebody who knew somebody, you know, that, that committed suicide, the rest of the class's hands went up. I go, it will affect you indirectly or directly. So if you have these tools, you know, and then you can see them perking up and listening. Oh, there's a why to all this versus here's another class. Here's another sexual harassment class. I got to take online and click. Yes, yes, no, no. And yeah. here's an event and I shouldn't look at Sally. So, you know, just to, to check it off the block, but to really understand what's going to happen to you in combat. You know, if I entered a room and said, who wants to get in a firefight with me? Everybody that raised their hands, I'd go pick everyone else because they've probably already been in one and they don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. The guys yeah. who haven't been in one think they want to get into it. And, and we need that. It's recruitment. Yeah. It's how you keep people coming in. It's how you keep motivation strong. But once you've been in so many firefights, you get to the point you're like, wow, I really hope I never get into another one. And I really hope I don't have to take another life because at the time you don't consider it. It's muscle memory again. You know, oh, yep. threat, kill it, threat, kill it. You never consider that it's a human. And then later in life, I guarantee you, no matter who they are, bad, yeah. good, or whatever, 
it's a, it's a moral injury that you have been taught not to do and it's going to creep up on you and consume you. Yeah. Yeah. So leaders need to be open and honest. We had one uh, senior instructor stand up and he's like, listen up guys, I'm going to let you know something every day on the way to work for six months. I had to pull over and cry. I had to pull over and cry. He goes, I'd lost my friends. He goes, I thinking about it on the way to work, how we used to work out six months every morning, pull over and cry. He goes, then it went to once a week or twice a week. And then once a month, he goes, I'm just getting to where I can drive to work without crying now. And they all looked at him like he's the guy that scared them all to death. Right. Yeah. Right. Pulled him aside. I said, you just created an environment where when you're a team leader now, and these guys are your young SF guys, they're going to be able to come to you when they have a problem because you made it okay because you did it, you know, yeah. show me kind of thing. And people don't remember what you tell them. They remember how you make them feel. So he made them feel comfortable and at ease and able to share their story with him because he'd been through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I was watching a video that, uh, on YouTube that you were talking about, um, the, the mission with Black Hawk Down and some of the lessons that you learned. And one of the, one of the major ones that you mentioned is, um, you know, just really, really, really expecting the unexpected and how that's, how that, uh, had impacted you, um, you know, in, in your career, but also just in life in general, maybe, could, uh, could you talk a little bit more about that, the importance of that? And yeah, people get, you know, how you get comfortable in your, in your consistency. You get up, you go to work, you do your coffee. There's this, there's this process and people get real comfortable in it. And that shapes society. If you look back when almost everybody was a warrior, everybody in society was a warrior. Now we'll have to go way back when we're hunting for our survival. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to keep animals out of our caves or out of our bomas or, or wherever we lived. Um, but you were closer together as a tribe. You depend on each other for survival, much like combat when you go overseas. But we all live in our homes now separately. We don't have that tribe feeling. We feel mm -hmm. near each other, but not connected. And that's what everybody misses. Um, so you take it to a point where these guys come back and they miss that tribe that they've been in and they're put back in society. And, they, and now it's back into that get up in the morning at the same time, get your coffee, let the dog out, drive to work in traffic. You sit there and do whatever you do all day and you go back home and it's monotonous. And they've spent their whole life preparing for something to happen, the unexpected to happen. And it's like they don't give themselves an opportunity to relax. Um, you can prepare and expect the unexpected at work on that level versus yeah waiting for that level where, where you get friends that go out and base jump off of a uh, radio tower antennas in the midnight, you know, yeah. you know a friend of mine died doing that, mm. jumping off of bridges, um, you know, parasailing behind a car and <laughs> breaking every bone <laughs> in your body. Um, yeah. Chasing that unexpected adrenaline rush. They got to let go of that and realize that you'll never, never meet combat again. You'll never ever feel, if you haven't been to combat, you'll never feel it. And you don't want to, Mm -hmm. Trust me. Yeah. Um, go ride a roller coaster somewhere, but <laughs> but yeah. don't, you know, once you've had combat and you come back, it's nothing else seems to satisfy you unless you look forward in your future. I don't, I don't look back anymore. I don't yeah. want to talk about that last high school touchdown pass. I threw, you know, <laughs> yeah, living right. in the dream, right. Um, yeah. My last combat mission or oh, I was in Delta, you know, Hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I was in Delta. Who gives a shit? Right? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I did. And yeah. it gave me tools for the future and, and I use them now to prep for the future, but I, I quit looking in my rear view mirror and I start looking through the windshield to see what's coming up. And I tell these people as, as good leaders and as, as, as good followers, because you need to be a good follower before you can be a good leader. Stop looking in the rear view. Those are just tools that everyone has. Good, yeah. good job on those tools. I mean, you got lucky to come over here. You did that. You got a couple extra tools, but nobody cares. You're not special unless you're special at that moment. And then a second later, you're just another guy on the street with the tools that nobody knows you have, unless you sit there and tell them, or you put your tool one file on the back windshield of your car, right? You know, right. guys are proud of what they do. And I understand that, but to live in that forever, yeah. it means you're going nowhere else. Mm -hmm. you know? so yeah. Get yeah. Get them to focus on the future. So true. But, um, well, yeah, speaking of that, you know, I know you talked about the moment, um, where you get the text message and you were thinking about 
committing suicide and, 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 and how, you know, your wife, Jen was the person that sent you that text and, and it brings you today. You guys are married and, and, and get the foundation, which, which to me sounds like you found purpose, right? I did. Um, yeah. Which keeps you going. And so, yeah, I'd like to talk maybe about that as far as, you know, the, what is the vision for you? What is, where is it that you're trying to go versus staying in the past and uh, past experiences, accomplishments, um, things that have happened to you? Um, yeah. What, what is the impact really that you hope to make and are making um, in the years forward? I hoped, um, I hope that we can break the stigma that asking for help is weakness. It's mm-hmm. literally a sign of strength to be able to look inward and know that you need help and ask for it. I mean, when we go to training, we know we can't do those tasks and we get trained to do it and that's okay. So instead of therapy, we call it training. So we're going to train you for this next thing. You know, we're not going to take care of you and fix you because you're not broken. You're a sum of all your experiences and your memories. You're not broken. We're going to fix where you're focused on and, and, and move forward. We want to take the foundation. um, Wow. We want to grow as big as we possibly can. We, we aren't brick and mortar right now. We, we travel around the United States and go where people need it. We find nice locations for our retreats that are serene, uh, you know, serene and quiet and comforting. Um, not like Disney, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Send a vet to Disney. I've been to Disney <laughs> yeah. once and it's uh, uh, all I see are little soldiers breaking down because they can't get candy, you know, running around yeah, and yeah. screaming and yeah. throwing fits all day. And the parents are like, why are we here? But it costs so much. Like that's combat. So that's not what we're looking for, but we want to keep it all scalable so we can double and quadruple and grow and have more therapists and help more people. I mean, right now we're, we're doing seven couples retreats this year. We're having 11 couples in each retreat. We're speaking to about 300 people four or five times this year, plus other speaking engagements. I want to be able to increase that and run multiple retreats at a time where I'm I'm not necessarily the guy going on. I'm like, Hey, I'm Tom. I got messed up. But I, other people that, that I know that know the message and feel the same way and can speak and get their message out to other people. It's cathartic for me. It's helpful for them as well to, to be back in service and have that purpose. Everybody knows that if people are re- relying on you, you're going to step up and you're going to work as hard as you can to make them happy and get them what they need. But if no one relies on you or you have that thought that no one needs you, as warriors, we start thinking, well, my job is over. I came mm-hmm. into this universe. I did my job. That's over. There's nothing for me. I can't be a cop anymore. I'm too old for that. I waited too long. And probably a bad idea anyway, after all that training, you know, it's yeah. not a lot of drop right. it, drop it in, in our business. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guys feel too wired. They live in, they're living in the past. And they think they're too wired, but really their mindset is in the past. And so I'd like to teach people to live in the present, looking to the future while you operate in the present to shape the future versus living in the past or relying on the past for your identity. So we want to keep that scalable. We want to go online, like I said, this year and always keep improving what we're doing. Much like I did my entire career. I did something. I was happy. I didn't sit there for very long and, and enjoy it which we need to do as humans. We need to enjoy Um, a therapist at the unit. When I got there said, listen, you climbed this mountain and you made it four months later, you jumped up on climbed another mountain and made a taller one He goes, now you climbed Everest and you're on top. What are you looking for? I go, why is there something, is there another unit out there that's secretive? And you know, I want to be in the unit that goes and kills everybody, you know, and, and be a spy. He's like, no, no, you're on top of Everest. My point is enjoy it. Mm Mm-hmm enjoy what you've done. And I never enjoyed what I did. I I just, how can I be better? How can I do more? How can I give more? And so now I want to enjoy what I'm doing, helping so many people and watch them help themselves by being of service to others. That is the one thing that's helped me the most. And I learned that by doing 20 years of CQB, I learned more when I was teaching CQB to students than I ever learned doing it. Yeah. And it's like when you help people, you know, you get that same feeling of purpose and joy, whether you're helping homeless or, or you know, the poor or, or veterans or anybody, any kind of act of service or any kind of act of kindness to, to the smallest smiling of people down the street. I always do these experiments where I used to be that frowny cat guy. (laughs) Nobody nobody wants to talk to me. The dogs don't like to come near me, but they always (laughs) love you. They love you. And she's like, you're, you're an ominous presence. 
there's, <laughs> yeah. a, there's a dark presence in you. You have that look of I'm going to rip your head off and eat it. <laughs> and, and I'm like, but I'm happy. She says, your yeah. face, nothing in your body shows happy. Nothing I'm says like, that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I do these experiments where I go around and just smile at everybody and people start waving and they start engaging and talking. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Let, me, let me take it a Dial step it further. And take it, yeah. I need to take it a step further next time and have something to say to somebody. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, the more kindness you give to the universe, the more you get back. Mm-hmm. And I never believed that, you know, my wife would talk the universe and energy and light and, you ask the universe for it and it'll, it'll, it shall come without trying. And I'm like, Oh God, shut up. <laughs> you know, if you want something, you go take it, you yeah. work for it and you take it, you know, and it's like the end of time. Are we going to be preppers and save stuff? I go, no, I'm going to go take other people's stuff. <laughs> yeah. Let them spend the rest of their life storing it up in their basement. I'll go take theirs. And you know, that was me before. And, and now it's like, okay, if I ask the universe for it, it will come. I'm thinking, what does that mean? Really? And it can mm-hmm. mean God. It could mean literally ask the universe. It could mean ask your guides or your spirits. But to me, it kind of means if you're looking for it, you'll find it. If I'm looking for miserable behavior and, and, and people to do bad things and people say mean things to me, my presence and my form probably displays that. And when I go out and I look for happiness and joy and kindness, and I'm already, all right, well, I'm not going to find it looking grumpy. So I get smiley and I perk up and I walk around yeah. and I find happiness. Yeah. And I realize it's that easy to find happiness, just, just start, right? Everybody's yeah. like, well, it's so hard. I go, what's hard about it? Yeah. Well, it's just so what? Just, just do it. Just yeah. walk around with a smile on your face for crying out loud. It's easier than frowning. What do they say? There's less muscles used to smile. Yeah, right, frown. Right. So do less of a workout, walk around smiling and tell me you can't smile, right? Tell me you can't smile. And then they'll, they'll smile. All right. Now walk around and see what happens. And to a person, the ones that do it come back and tell me, Oh my God, I can't believe how easy it is to see good out there when you look for good. I go, yeah, yeah. cause you're very good at finding what you're looking for. If you're looking for bad, yeah. horrible things, yeah. you're watching the news, which is all negative, And you're watching all those videos on, on social media that, you know, scrolling through the cops getting shot or pulling people over and everybody's messing with each other on social media nowadays. And oh, I got a gun, but you can't do anything about it. Cop. You know, I'm like, it's a waste of your day. You're yeah. looking at all the negative stuff, you know, look at all the kittens purring and laughing and jumping <laughs> right. around and stuff. It just, it's a, it's a physical change in your body. You know, it's yeah. biological that makes you happier and, yeah. and people that do it, understand it and get it. It's impossible to be in a bad mood when you're smiling. Right. right. It, it, it. I've, I've tried yeah. it. I've yeah. tried it and I can't, <laughs> yeah. as soon as you smile, serotonin, yeah. boom, everything yeah. changes. It's biological and you can't yeah. help it. So and we practice that. You said was, uh, you know, if you're looking for it, and the meaning of looking for something, like you said, is actually you're actually doing something to find it, right? Like you're not right. just waiting for it to come to you. So yeah, I mean, right. Yeah. You don't just sit there. Um, your thoughts always become your words. Mm-hmm. Your words become your actions. So if you're thinking negatively and you're trying to fake it, it won't work either. So you know, yeah, mentally. Prepare yourself just like in training, just like in combat. I close my eyes and think about what I needed to do. And okay, time to get to work. Open my eyes and get mm-hmm. going. But I tell everybody, do the same thing. You've been given the tools in life. You know, I've had guys that do, uh, that, uh, you know, did FIT or did guerrilla warfare or counterintelligence. And they get out and like, oh, I don't know what to do. I can't get a job in counterintelligence. I go, take that process, that guerrilla warfare process of identifying the element, you know, find their weaknesses and their strengths and build up on that. I go, take that whole planning process that you've already, you already know and convert it a little bit into the civilian world and use it. They won't even yeah. know you're using it on them, but it'll right. work great. You know, yeah. these things yeah, work. Yeah. We have all the tools. We just don't understand that we can use them in the civilian world still alter mm-hmm. them a bit, you know, but they work. Yeah. They work in the worst situations, So they're bound to work in the easy ones. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I really appreciate you uh, taking some time today. I want to, I, I want to uh, respect your time. So um, there'll be one last question here yet, but, but uh, if you haven't definitely check out the book, All Secure, a special operations soldiers fight to survive on the battlefield and the home front uh, by Tom Satterley. Uh, last question I do have for you here is, um, you know, what would be one or two things that you could 
that you could give the listeners that if they implemented today, like they could put into action right now, right, right today, uh, you know, it would help move them forward uh, today. I would say what we just talked about, yeah. put a smile on your face and shake five people's hands and mm-hmm. say something positive to them and watch yeah. what happens, yeah. right? Pick up your phone, you know, number two and go a little deeper. Pick up your phone and call that friend you haven't called in a long time. That one that got really uncomfortable because it's been way too long. And now yeah. you're like over that hump of, of excuses and, oh, it's been a year now. I, you know, I was walking the dog and forgot. But, you know, pick up the phone and call that person. Um, you know, this is not just for veterans, but I would say for the veterans, pick up the phone and call that, that friend you haven't heard from in a while. That one you think is strong. Yeah. It's the strong side right. ones that just end up doing it, that don't ask for help. And for civilians, um, I'd say even, even the book, the book All Secure is not just for veterans. It's for people who want to know a better way to go about life. You know, we all have our ups and downs. We all have our problems. And this book is a, is a book about problems and what they do to you and getting over them, really, no matter what mm-hmm. that problem is. Insert guns and war, insert hospital and deaths, insert law enforcement, you know, insert anything. Um, we all live that life. And uh, there's no reason to go around fighting angry and mad at the world all the time. You get one go, right? You get one go. Yeah, yeah. You don't occupy that much space on this planet. <laughs> right. A lot of mileage on this planet. Yeah. You occupy such a small space. So don't take everything so seriously. Let it, let it go. Yeah. Yeah. We get one go and, and uh, we, there's, there's zero guarantee like how long that go is. So, right. It could be, it could be, I could drop yeah. dead now. I mean, yeah. there's a good chance of that. So yeah. you know, might, as well, might as well do it happy. Right. Well, I appreciate you. Is there anything else uh, that you'd like to uh, let the listeners know how we can find you, how we can help you? Um, yeah. yeah. Any, anything you need, if anybody needs help, they can go to allsecurefoundation.org. Now we're not a crisis hotline. Um, mm-hmm. I answer as fast as I can emails, texts, and this and that. We are not the crisis hotline. There's, there's hotlines for that. There's 911. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't feel safe, get safe. But if you want help, you can go to our foundation page, allsecurefoundation.org. You can scroll through there. If you want to donate, you can donate there. If you want to buy shirts or hats or anything there, all that money goes to help these veterans go on these retreats and their spouses, and they don't pay a penny for it. That's awesome. And we put all of our money back into the foundation. Love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. I love the time that I've had with you. Uh, Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good day. Thanks, you too.